On December 22nd, 2014, I bought Saints Row 4 on Steam. I didn't know it then, but that was the day I found my favorite video game developer. I spent that entire Christmas holiday playing a unique kind of absurdity from the minds at Volition. As time went on, Volition's adventures took me from the streets of Stillwater to the sands of Mars. And when I had made my way through the rest of their library, there was nothing left to do but wait until they'd announce their next game. A year passed, and on June 6th, 2016, the wait was over. Volition's next title would be Agents of Mayhem. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite games. How Volition constructed Agents of Mayhem and the numerous challenges it had to overcome to see its release. You're also going to learn about how its world and characters came to life, the technical investments behind its visuals, and the brilliance of its combat design. We'll even discuss the fallout after the game's underperformance and its future that never was. Finally, it is my absolute pleasure to tell you that you'll be hearing about these things from someone who was there, as I had the chance to sit down with the game's lead writer, Jason L. Blair, to help paint the best picture we could of such a fantastic game. This is Agents of Mayhem, Volition's Finest. Yeah, I'm uh, Jason L. Blair. Uh, I've been in video games since 2005. Uh, I was at Volition for seven years. I was uh, I worked on Saints Row 4, and then I was lead writer on Agents of Mayhem. Agents of Mayhem, or AOM, is an open-world third-person shooter where you can play as 15 different characters. One of the most fascinating things about games research is understanding the decisions made during their development cycles and how they shaped the projects into what you see when you play them. Oftentimes, a good amount of these decisions are made long before a game is even a realized concept. And this is where the story of Agents of Mayhem begins. Volition's previous game, Saints Row 4, was a complete anomaly. Not only did it start out as an expansion for Saints Row the Third, it also changed publisher hands after THQ went bankrupt and Volition was bought by Deep Silver. What most don't know is that while Saints Row 4 was being developed, Volition was also hard at work on creating a new game engine. Next-gen consoles were right around the corner, and Volition's technology had to keep up with the times. After Saints Row 4 shipped, the studio began to think about what was next. Saints Row 4 ended in such a bombastic manner, right? And it was a level of kind of beautiful ridiculousness. You get to a point of like, what, is, what's, what does Saints Row 5 look like? Like what, you know, like what are, what are we doing? And I think when you hit that point, you just need to, you just need to accept the fact that you've, you've said what you can say. Agents of Mayhem was not Volition's first idea for their next game. There was a project codenamed Zeus that came before. It was set in a post-apocalyptic Rio and had very heavy Wild West influence. Zeus was scrapped before it made it to any serious planning stages, as it was determined to be outside of what Volition considered their core competencies, which are essentially the things that your studio are proficient at. Even though it was cancelled, Zeus did still serve a very important purpose, and that was allowing Volition to do introspection on the type of studio they'd become. They found that their strengths were in creating open-world games that focused on humor, character customization, and co-op. It wasn't long after this that there was a direction chosen for the studio's next project. You know, it was eventually decided of like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, we're going to reinvent uh, Saints Row. And that all happened as part of a very small core team. The idea of like this kind of, you know, M-rated G.I. Joe happened. And, and you know, it, it itself had a lot of iteration as far as what it was going to be. Once it was decided of like, hey, let's give people toys, let's give people action figures. I think that's really, that's really when it took off, that it wasn't going to be a central character. As Volition had done so many games with a single player character, there was a lot of discussion about finally deviating from this formula. Focusing on a single player is kind of the on a single character is kind of the default assumption made in games, and so it's just one of those things of like if it goes unchallenged, it will just live. But what happened was it got challenged, and again early on, fairly early on, it got challenged. And once it was challenged, once we were like, wait a minute, we're just assuming that's the right call of how, let's have a single character, let's have you know the the boss analog that that yeah, there was no going back. 
Now this idea was beginning to take shape. Volition's next game would be a reimagining of Saints Row that starred numerous characters. The following months were spent concepting and creating a vision for the game that would put the team on the same page as the game entered production. It was during this time that the game gained visual and narrative cohesion. So the initial, like the touchstones of like Saturday morning cartoons and, and stuff like that, that was established really early, like in the, the, the vision boards that, that were posted all over the office and stuff like that. But Saturday morning redux was a term that was introduced by the animation team. Once that term entered, it, it helped solidify the concepts and ideas that had already been floating around for a couple months. What, what that helped inform was kind of like, it, narratively anyway, helped inform the scenarios in which the players are going to find themselves. You may ask, if Volition believed that they were a studio that was skilled at creating open world experiences with features like character customization, then why did they commit to a game that wouldn't have many of the systems that fans of older Volition games would come to expect? There is a very good reason for that. And this is the case where the technology pushed back on kind of what Volition's identity was, right? If you think of like the Saints Row games, co-op, and like a really fun co-op experience and deep and or broad customization, character customization, we didn't have the tech foundation to do. The cases of, it was identified as kind of a core competency of the studio, but they're not present in Agents of Mayhem. People want to know where the co-op was. And it's like, yeah, that's a really good question. Volition's new engine was powerful and versatile, but it lacked many of the tools it needed to implement systems from their previous games when Agents of Mayhem was being built. Volition's new growing technology was part of the reason behind many of the approaches to the systems in AOM. You know, we use uh, 2D cartoons. We use cartoons to tell our story. There were a couple reasons for that, one of which is, again, building off of technology, building off of new engine of not, you know, like it not having all of the cinematic stuff from jump ready to go. When we look at like, you know, when I talk about like cinematics specifically, you look at like Saints Row 4 and we go to a cutscene and you see your character, your customized character moving in a, in a 3D space. That's not free, right? Like someone needs to develop that technology of creating a robust in-game uh, you know, cinematic rendering system and all the all the things of like, you know, grabbing and updating player characters and all that stuff, right? Like, and that's stuff that just didn't exist at the time of launch on that engine uh, for Agents of Mayhem, or rather when we needed to start telling story in Agents of Mayhem. Of course, you can't just not make a game because your engine is in development at the same time as the game you're creating, especially not when your studio has just been bought for over $22 million and is expected to deliver a product. Volition worked around these constraints and came up with new ideas like 2D cutscenes to get past what their engine could not yet achieve. A number of these workarounds actually ended up being wins in the long run. For example, because their cutscenes were 2D, that meant they didn't have to spend time creating environments, props, and characters for cutscenes that you'd only see once. 2D cutscenes also complemented the aesthetic and tone of the game, which by then was starting to have its story fleshed out, and this led Volition to another realization about the game. But the story of Agents of Mayhem was something that went through numerous iterations. But you know, the scope had the scope started out much larger than what shipped. So the story and the story, you know, story's goldfish, right? The story will expand to fit whatever space you get of it. I will say narratively, it used to be a lot larger scope. Um, there used to be a lot more non-linearity to the pathing of the story, and then you know, at some point, it was a matter of like, we we have overscoped um, for our technology, we have overscoped for our time, uh, we have overscoped, and we and we need and we need to constrict and, and every, every discipline felt that. And um, the story was no exception. Though many games are initially overscoped, Agents of Mayhem was a game facing many uncertainties, which were what led to so many unknown quantities about the game that needed to be figured out. Volition wasn't just building a new engine either. They were also undergoing structural changes, and one of these was in how they approached managerial development. 
A flat structure was tried for Agents of Mayhem. A flat structure is one that gives employees a roughly equal level of power as there are fewer management roles. This structure made it so Volition could create specialized teams for each aspect of the game that could more easily communicate with one another and make decisions without needing to go through several layers of management. I was, you know, lead writer on it and worked close with the writing team. The writing team worked really close with the agent team who were developing the, um, the combat kits for the agents and in turn we were working really closely with the animators. What it allowed us to do kind of having like dedicated uh, writers of like, hey, as a writer, you own this character, which isn't to say you're going to write every line they ever say, but you're kind of the authority on this character. What was great about that, because the agents team worked in a similar way and the animation team worked in a similar way of like, hey, you own this character's combat kit, you own this, you know, character's, uh, you know, animation. And so what you'd have is you'd have the writer, the combat person, the anim and the animator for a single character. They were able to just get together and talk and deliver. As the game moved into full production, the AOM team would have to create a new open world and the characters to populate it. It was time for Volition's core competencies to come into play and their new engine to shine. After Saints Row 2, Volition knew that their methods of world creation were incredibly inefficient. Stillwater in SR2 was built by 19 full-time environment artists, and because of the way the geometry of the city was being modeled, changes to the city became more and more difficult to implement the further the game got into development. So for Saints Row the Third, Volition created a new world editor that gave Steelport's 16 environment artists far more control over things like road and terrain generation. It also let them move entire city islands and more quickly address scalability issues. Fast forward to Agents of Mayhem and Volition's world editor was the most refined it had ever been. The beautiful city of Seoul was chosen as the world of AOM and for the first time in Volition's history, world builders were no longer responsible for also making world materials. Previously, they had to do both jobs, but for AOM, a separate materials team was created, which freed up world builders to focus on more specific jobs. This, combined with their editor's implementation of something called spline-based modeling, allowed them to build Seoul in a year and a half with just six environment artists. With world creation in great hands, Volition's artists threw the kitchen sink at the task of designing characters. Early concept art for the game depicted agents as larger-than-life superheroes fighting an evil organization. Over a hundred agents were pitched and hundreds of potential agent designs drafted. Most of the agents in the final game started out as concept art. Sometimes a design was so strong that members of multiple teams decided decided that character had to be in the game. This is how we got Daisy, the uncensored minigun wielding rockabilly skater. For other agents, there were character concepts that were chosen and expanded upon. A great example of this is Fortune. She was the game's first agent designed and was born from a single post-it note that just read, High Tech Pirate. Fortune's creation was very important as she served as a guide for agent design going forward and was one of the game's guinea pigs for material creation and animation work. Agents of Mayhem was Volition's first 8th gen game, and with any generational jump, there's the expectation that you'll have more memory and polygons to create your new worlds and characters with. While more polygons and the game's stylization were a huge step up for the look of AOM, the arrival of several new rendering techniques are what really completed its amazing presentation and solidified Agents of Mayhem as Volition's best-looking game to date. Arguably the most important of these was physically based rendering, or PBR, which is a technique that allows the reflection of light to be accurately simulated on surfaces. Texture maps with unique values are used to represent how much light the material should reflect and how rough the material should be. AOM's new engine was carefully optimized to support this texture workflow, and the results were incredible. Lazarus, for example, is an agent covered in reflective surfaces. With PBR, all lighting around them is reflected in these spots in a physically accurate manner. The PBR workflow was also used for weapons, cars, and all of the materials in Seoul. The energy put into the design and rendering of characters was equally matched by AOM's animation team. Because Agents of Mayhem is a game with 15 playable characters, 
each team working on them needed to understand the importance of keeping them unique. You don't want 12 daisies because then daisy is not, not distinct. We have daisy. So let's make sure that no one else is overlapping on daisy, right? And so let's counter that with an oni, right? And then let's have hardtack who is like, you know, we define hardtack as this. And then we have, of course, the, the support characters of the arc and stuff like that who have to fit into these roles as well. But narratively, that's what we're looking at is like making sure that we are talking about distinct personalities and distinct perspectives that are not, not too much overlap because 15 probably sounds like a lot, but it's actually kind of not. Like if you have a hundred characters, then you can have a lot more overlap in gray area as far as who's there, how one person is different than another. If you have 15, they've got to be distinct. For the animation team, this meant that agent animation had to acknowledge their personalities in and out of combat. Each agent has unique animations for walking, jogging, sprinting, jumping, primary weapon use, melee, wall climbing, mayhem abilities, car entry, idols, and emotes. AOM's animation team excelled at their part of making the characters distinct by creating new animation tools and collaborating with the gameplay and writing teams so they could understand who the characters were and whether or not certain actions suited them. Unlike many games where a variety of aspects are created independent of their story and characters, Volition's amazing communication allowed its writers to play an unprecedented role in establishing the game's visual identity while they also wrote the game's story. Agents of Mayhem began as a reimagining of Saints Row. So much so that the agents were originally called saints. This idea was scrapped early on, and instead the saints turned into an organization named Mayhem. Though it would no longer be a Saints Row game, fans of the series will note that in the retcon ending of Gat Out of Hell, Johnny Gat is set to interrogate a woman named Brimstone. This was the same Brimstone that founded Mayhem. Or was it? I don't know that we could say that she was created for Agents of Mayhem. Like, that character existed. I don't know. Like, so that was Steve Jaros, who was creative director uh, at Volition at the time. Him working with the team. He was he was uh, the writer on Got Out of Hell. I don't know what was in his brain as far as, like, how this continues of this character. I don't know at the studio level what had been established as far as, like, next IP. So I don't really know. I know Persephone is canonically the first character, but it's kind of like saying Tobe Maguire's Spider-Man is the first character in the MCU. You know? It's like technically true. I don't know. I don't know how planned that was. <laughs> it was decided that Agents of Mayhem would take place in Gat Out of Hell's retconned universe where the boss and subsequently the Third Street Saints never existed. Despite the gang's omission, it was always the plan to have characters from the series appear, such as Pierce Washington. Pierce, or Kingpin, was primarily written by Jeff Bielowski, who worked on Saints Row 1, the third, and four. Since the Saints Row characters would be in a universe where the Saints didn't exist, it gave the writing team the ability to present them from a new perspective. So Pierce Washington historically has been, you know, a put upon character in the Saints Row world and never really given his due by the boss, by other people. He really is that person who's kind of smarter than he's ever been allowed to be. And so to, when bringing him over, it's like, what if Pierce Washington but respect? Of course, while AOM features other familiar faces like Kinsey Kensington, Oleg, and Johnny Gat, the goal was still to make it largely comprised of brand new characters. Agents of Mayhem features some of Volition's best character work ever, and no one embodies this more than Daisy. When you're built like a brick shithouse and all you care about is fucking and fighting and then something comes along like Devil's Night, what the hell else are you supposed to do? Daisy, the, the concept of Daisy, this like, you know, <laughs> this absolutely unfiltered sh a Chicago Derby girl. I loved writing her. I loved, again, just being absolutely un unapologetic as far as what I said, how I said it. She's very much her. She doesn't care. Daisy never once thinks about anything she says. Right? It just it just comes out and you fucking deal with it because she doesn't care. She doesn't care if you like her or not. She really doesn't. And so she's like, I'm me. Deal with it. 
As we'll discuss soon, the ability to dynamically switch between characters and choose from a character pool is incredible for gameplay, but for narrative, it presents the issue of the game never knowing who you're playing. In games with one player character, the story can be moved forward by the protagonist because all game systems only have to refer to that person. For games with multiple protagonists though, this is impossible because of how many variables the game would have to take into account depending on who you're currently playing. Agents of Mayhem's solution to this problem was structuring its missions using call and response. The character you're playing is called by either a villain or a secondary character and responds to events going on in the game's world. This made it so the game never had to specify who the currently selected character was and could remain neutral while still moving the story forward. Narrative specific engine tools were built for this exact purpose, so the writing team could be the ones inserting response voice lines for the characters instead of having mission designers input them as was commonplace at Volition before AOM. There were some amongst the Agents of Mayhem team that believed the characters having an introduction cinematic and unique voice lines for main story missions was enough time spent with them, but others disagreed and advocated for each agent having their own specific mission. Agent missions were a highly debated topic during the development of the game. And those almost didn't ship. That was uh, that was not an easy victory because they're you know when it comes down to like controlling scope, they're easy to cut. I understand it. Like yeah, they're they're non-essential storytelling as far as the golden path. That said, they are essential storytelling for these characters. If we are ultimately selling characters, I mean the name of the game is Agents of Mayhem. If we're selling the agents, then then we need time with them. And all you would get is a little cinematic saying, here's who they were. You're not going to see who they are. But, and also, you know, there were people in production. Again, I don't want to think, it's not, I don't want to paint some picture like it was dev versus prod. It was just, it was, it was reality versus reality, right? Of like reality being, we need these missions. And the other reality being, you need to find someone to do them. Obviously, AOM cared a lot about its characters as they were the game's entire selling point. You've seen the great amount of work that went into creating their looks and personas, but now it's time to analyze how the game uses them in its incredible combat. It's in the name, Agents of Mayhem. Volition considers their players to be purveyors of destruction with lots of toys at their disposal. In AOM, the toys are the agents, and you create mayhem by obliterating wave after wave of Legion soldiers. In older Volition games, I found that combat quickly got stale because every confrontation was fought on enemy terms. Enemies either forced you to take cover or just stood there and let themselves get killed. I credit this to grounded player movement and very passive artificial intelligence. Saints Row the Third's Trouble with the Clones DLC was Volition's first attempt at enhanced movement, and once it was iterated upon for Saints Row 4's entire gameplay loop, the player finally had control over how they fought beyond just their weapon choices. Its addition of vertical movement and other superpowers gave way for very dynamic combat by allowing you to reposition during fights and tackle groups of enemies at your own pace. Agents of Mayhem follows this design ideology to its logical next step by giving characters 360 degree super movement in the form of triple jumps and dashing. Some agents can even dash in the air and those that can't dash can become invisible. What these mechanics create is an environment where the player can juke enemies, close distance between them, and reposition during fights as many times as they'd like. This gives you the control in combat, and in tandem with the game's notably more aggressive AI that chases you, it makes every fight exhilarating. If this was all Agents of Mayhem had done with its combat, I'd still say it was pretty good, but what puts it in a league of its own is how combat is also affected by agent abilities, gadgets, and the game's buffs and debuffs. Each agent has a unique weapon, special ability, and passive with behavior that can be modified by changing what gadget is attached to them. Hollywood, for example, is the game's standard run-and-gun character, but you decide what his grenade launcher rounds 
due to enemies, the speed at which he moves, the duration of his ultimate, and much more. It's not only amazing that the player is given an opportunity to design their own gameplay experience, but that it actually makes a tangible difference in the way you approach combat with different character builds and agent compositions. There's an even more profound level of choice when you unlock Legion tech that adds a bonus attribute to gadgets. Agents of Mayhem is not just the most fun I've ever had playing a Volition game, it's some of the most fun I've ever had in any game. It's one of the most unique sandbox games I've ever played that, most impressively, never falls into the trap of playing itself. Despite all of the game's early setbacks, the team at Volition persevered and announced Agents of Mayhem in 2016. The game would then undergo a soft relaunch in 2017 and was slated for an August release date. The stretch between April and August of 2017 is when serious trouble began brewing for the game in the form of the game's marketing. Yeah, I mean, the marketing, you know, I, I've talked to numerous people who, who couldn't tell me what, who saw the marketing for Agents of Mayhem and couldn't tell me what the game was. There were people who thought it was a hero shooter, people who thought it was a MOBA. Outwardly, I think if you just looked at the marketing materials for Agents of Mayhem, you wouldn't, you didn't know what the game was. And I think that the fact that a DLC character was featured so prominently in the marketing was messed up. I, I think the marketing wasn't as strong as it could be, but I don't think that's why. Agents of Mayhem underperformed. The Gat Is Back campaign was a major marketing success for Saints Row 4, and the same strategy was used for Agents of Mayhem. There were those that thought the promotion of the game's characters from Saints Row would increase pre-orders, but this had the opposite effect. It decreased them. And by so heavily focusing on characters from another franchise, the already weak marketing was never able to convey the game's original characters or what the game was even about, to the point where a trailer had to be released telling people that Agents of Mayhem was not a Saints Row game. The game's best promotion was spearheaded by Volition employees Mike Watson and Josh Stinson, who, leading up to the release of the game, organized streams highlighting all of the game's agents. They featured members of each design team and even the voice actors of the agents themselves. These streams were how my excitement for the game began, but unfortunately they didn't have the necessary reach to influence perception of the game. Agents of Mayhem released on August 15th, 2017. I still remember that day and the countless hours of fun I had playing the game, but as I looked around to friends and others talking about it, the fun that I was having seemed like an anomaly. The game's bugs and complaints concerning its design and writing dominated all conversations about it, and its reviews from large publications echoed those sentiments. Shortly after its release, Volition went silent and the release of the game's already advertised DLC was barely promoted. A lack of communication this soon after launch only ever means one thing, and only ever leads to one thing. It wasn't long after Agents of Mayhem shipped that uh, Volition had a layoff. There was a lot of cost invested in AOM, because again, we, 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 it, was a flagship, it was a flagship game for a brand new engine, and you know, rightfully so, programmers make a lot of money. <laughs> so engines are expensive and so that was part of it not certainly not all of it but that was part of it right and so it's like we had we had a cost that needed to be amortized and it wasn't and so when the initial reviews came in you know we knew the reviews before we knew the sales numbers and we never even really entirely knew the sales numbers those are kept pretty close to the vest but you know you can see things like number of concurrent users on steam and you can get a feel for like well you know and you can see how quickly your game enters the bargain bin it, it, disappointment it, there's a bit of heartbreak and in addition to you know layoff you know a lot of people left i left volition uh in may of 2018 i was I had plans to move on six months after it shipped I had disappointment. I was heartbroken. I, you know, uh, had a lot of feelings. I had a lot of feelings um, about, you know, we, we invested four years plus into this game. Yeah, there was, there was, there was disappointment. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of anger because you know you 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 worked really hard on something. You fought against a lot of things outside of your control, and so to see a lot of hard work and a lot of love 
uh, and a lot of investment kind of land with a thud. And then to see, to go into work one day and to see friends and people you know work their asses off, you know, be like, oh, it's demoralizing. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch your friend clean up their desk. It's heartbreaking to know the person who fought hard for a feature you loved or, or a decision you loved or whatever, um, to see them walk out of the building for the last time. There's no joy in that. And then there's, and there's no bouncing back. You don't work that day. Even if you were not let go, you don't work that day. These are the unfortunate realities of game development. You try, and sometimes it doesn't work out. Immediately following the release of Agents of Mayhem, Volition employees who remained after the layoffs were shifted to the studio's next project. This project would end up becoming the reboot of Saints Row. But how could you make a new Saints Row after gutting the studio responsible for the franchise? During the development of Agents of Mayhem, Volition was owned by Deep Silver. Less than a year after the release of AOM, Deep Silver's own parent company was bought by THQ Nordic for $149 million. This reunited Volition with the Red Faction IP, which was previously sold off, and also miraculously gave them the chance to hire back many of the employees they lost in the AOM layoff. Even through all the hardships, Agents of Mayhem is looked back fondly by the people who worked on it, as it should be. Volition is my favorite studio because no matter the challenges they face during the creation of their games, they always deliver something that is uniquely theirs. Their brand of action comedy is unlike any other studios, and I know that whenever I pick up one of their games, I'm going to have fun. A studio can only consistently produce games like that when the culture exists internally. There were key people in, in key roles and key disciplines in Agents of Mayhem that were, that were entirely invested in delivering the game. And without them, I don't know what would have shipped. Uh, a game would have shipped, but there's a lot, and you're not going to see this reflected in the, in the, in the Metacritic, you're not going to see this reflected in the sales, but there's so much love put into that game. It was 200 of the closest friends I've ever made. It was people I'd walk into hell with, people I admired deeply, people who were open to absolutely absurd ideas and would just plus one it over and over, right? Like, that's how the Saints Row games happen. That's how Agents of Mayhem happened, and I imagine that's how the new Saints Row happened, where it's you, I mean, I love Volition, I love the people of Volition, uh, I love the studio, I love the culture that I knew. Volition was a beautiful dream during my time there. Now, much to my dismay, we live in a universe where Agents of Mayhem underperformed. But before I go, how about I show you a universe where it didn't? Let's talk about the game's cut content and what would have happened if the game had been a financial success. During its production, over 100 agents were pitched. The 15 agents in the game today were chosen as the strongest, but some of the cut agents got as far as having introduction cinematics made for them. I know of four of them. There was Marlo, the gigantic detective with a cyber arm. Coyote, a hunter who could track down anything. Houston, the gunslinger with a heart of gold. And last but not least, there's Jawbreaker, an extremely temperamental science experiment. It's not like anything was like done and ready to go and then was just cut. Ultimately, anyone who was cut, they were cut because there was there was going to be some bottleneck they wouldn't have gotten past. Some of them just conceptually probably weren't super strong. Like, I don't know that Marlo ever would have shipped, but like Jawbreaker for me, like I said, would be absolute. If I could res anyone, it'd be them. These agents were cut, but it's not difficult to believe that if AOM had succeeded that they wouldn't have found their way into the game at some point because Agents of Mayhem was going to have a large DLC expansion. This DLC would have seen the agents leaving Seoul and traveling to a nearby temple to take on Legion, which would have led them into an underground volcanic base. Easily the most ambitious of Volition's post-release plans was mod support. They planned to share mod tools for the game, similar to the SDK and Steam Workshop integration for Saints Row 4. They even wanted to pursue making mods available on console. None of these things ever happened, 
but I get a strange sense of joy knowing that they could have. Even now, I have a feeling that we haven't seen the last of these characters. If it isn't obvious by now, I don't just love this game. I fucking love this game, and I have since 2017. I hope you learned something today, whether it be about the game or game development itself. This was the story of Agents of Mayhem.